In this video, we're going to Madison Cube Garden. No. <laughs> no. It's Cubes OS. Cubes OS, yeah. But I, I don't know. I don't know how else we're going to fit in the joke. Cubes OS. Is it yet another Linux distribution? I'm so tired of Linux distributions. Well, this is actually not another <laughs> Linux distribution. Now, if you've watched our level one news, and if you haven't, what's wrong with you? We're constantly talking about security threats. There is not a week that goes by that there's not at least two, at least two horrible security threats. Really bad. It's Windows, it's Android, and hey, even Linux. <laughs> Linux is not immune. Constantly, everybody asks, what can I do? What, how can I protect myself? How can I lock it down? Well, Cubes OS will go a long way. Yeah, we get a lot of, of requests. Uh, Cubes is a project that I've been following for a long time, and it's running here on this laptop. This is an Asus UX32VD. This is an older model. It's an Ivy Bridge i7. So it's four cores, eight threads. I've upgraded the, the memory. So I think it's 10 or 12 gigabytes of memory. It's an older laptop, but we're running Cubes OS and it's actually really funny. I've got a Windows VM over here. <laughs> this is running Chrome in a Windows VM. And then seamlessly here is Firefox in another VM that's running Choplifter on an Apple II emulator because why not virtual machines, right? Uh, Cubes supports hardware pass-through. There are other VMs here that you don't see that are running the network, that are running the firewall. You can spool up a copy of, of Firefox that's in a disposable VM. And, you know, you know, it's like, well, wait a minute. So this laptop has like a virtual network and like five, you just named five virtual machines that are running on this thing. Who, who what sort of crazy masochist would want to do that? Compartmentalization for security. That's why you would want to do that. Right. Now, out of the box, this thing gives you named VMs like personal, work, untrusted, and like we talked about, disposable. Like uh, if you use the, the Chrome incognito window, it's like, hmm, that's a risky click. <laughs> Let's just pull up a disposable VM so that if this infects me with some sort of horrible malware, just make it go away. Just yeah. just, <laughs> just put destroy that VM with fire. It's and, an incognito operating system. <laughs> yeah. Nothing of value was lost. So... <laughs> The idea isn't that you can shield yourself or that you can protect yourself. You probably can't. That's just the harsh reality. But what you can do is compartmentalize everything down into these little individual boxes and make sure that the dangerous stuff never comes near the important boxes. Yeah. You can even run Tor in some of your virtual machines or you can enable Tor, you know, sort of globally in the virtual machine that's responsible for the networking for all of the other virtual machines which is it's sort of a, a crazy concept to wrap your head around. It's like all of your applications are running inside a virtual machine, which is running on this laptop. Now there is overhead, there's an overhead penalty associated with that. Uh, the Windows 7 VM that I've set up here, that's running applications seamlessly. You know, it doesn't really work with Windows 10 because of the changes in Windows 10 that's being worked on. But as of right now, the ticket for that on GitHub is stalled because they don't have anybody to work on it. They don't have anybody to work on the, on the compatibility. And admittedly, the security in Windows 10 is much better than Windows 7, but uh, you can run Windows 10, just not seamlessly, where you click on an application. But side by side, you can have two copies of Firefox, one in an untrusted VM, and that's going to have a red border, and you can have a trusted VM that's running with a green border. And neither of these two copies of Firefox can see each other or do anything malicious with, with, either, uh, with either one of them. But at the same time, you do have a level of interconnectivity. So you can actually... With a little bit of work, you can pass files between these VMs and you can use the clipboard between all of them. So you do have this overall operating system that is doing some of the more basic commands among all your little VMs. So they are not just all out there on their own. Yeah, and, and like we say, the name of the game with this VM is compartmentalization. So there are some downsides when you compartmentalize that heavily all the different kinds of things that you might be running in your different virtual machines. Maybe the biggest downside is hardware, you know, and this is something that comes up with regular Linux distributions too. This laptop actually works really well, but not all laptops are going to work really well. You can easily find some weird network adapter or audio controller or even the mouse pad that <laughs> is just not going to work. Mouse pad, touch pad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There are, I have seen mouse pad incompatibilities in my days, but it's a video for another time. <laughs> yeah, the networking, for example, is hardware pass-through. So you, you read about PCI Express pass-through. I've done videos on graphics card pass-through. Cubes, by default, wants to pass through your network adapter 
through to the networking virtual machine. That, that goes for wireless network adapters as well as wired network adapters. And so that means setting up the wireless is a little bit fiddly on cubes uh, on some laptops. This one in particular, I actually had to go in and manually add a shortcut to the wireless configuration utility in the virtual machine that handles the network because it wasn't there by default. Wired connections with cubes though, in my experience, have generally you know, been pretty flawless as long as the network card is supported. Another hardware drawback is RAM. Because, for example, if you're going to boot a Windows virtual machine, it's going to allocate RAM. And, you know, Windows <laughs> might need a lot of RAM. Windows and, is not frugal with RAM. <laughs> yeah, and so once you've allocated that RAM to Windows, it's no longer available to any of the other VMs. So it is a very memory-hungry way to run a computer, depending on what you're running. Now, with the, the Linux VMs, they're a little bit better about that. Yeah. They're a lot better about that. But you still have to think about it. You don't have an infinite supply of resources with which to spool up. And there's no like, you know, Android dealing with, oh, I don't need that app anymore. Let me have that memory. No, once it's allocated, it's allocated. Yeah, yeah. It, it is true that the Linux applications are a little bit closer to containers than full virtual machines. So they can, you know, sort of pick and choose, get up, give up memory and release memory and that sort of thing. But you can totally run Android x86 um, through some, you know, if you want to run like a Hackintosh version of the Mac OS, you can totally do that. We're, you know, again, we're running Apple II <laughs> emulation in the browser. Things like good old games, old DOS games, those sorts of virtual machines, you can run those as well. And all on a single machine and all on a, on a relatively modest laptop. I mean, this is the future. Uh, you, you don't think that, you know, it's like, well, wait a minute, these guys, you know, who's going to run a virtual machine? This is crazy. If you've ever downloaded an old game from good old games, you're using exactly the same kind of technology. Yeah, it's really common for those old games to come with DOSBox. And GOG actually goes through all the work of making an EXE that just does it for you. But it's doing the same thing that we're doing here. And you can actually run the native operating system and play Choplifter as it was played <laughs> in, the, <laughs> Apple II. In, the, in the 80s when dinosaurs <laughs> roamed the earth. <laughs> The, uh, the really exciting thing about this, though, is the future. Like, the future of this kind of thing, I think, is computing. And you can kind of get a glimpse of what the future is going to be because technology moves so fast that rather than try to maintain compatibility, you know, for DOS and your current operating system all the way back to the 80s, it's just going to be faster and easier to maintain that through emulation, through virtualization, through other technologies that provide the legacy facilities but also compartmentalize those legacy facilities because, you know, running DOS, that's a security risk. Running a program designed for Windows 95 or 98, that's a security risk. This is a great solution. Uh, when we talk about, for example, the recent ransomware attack, if, if you're watching this in 2018, in 2017, there was a ransomware attack. It was bad. And so that targeted older operating systems. A lot of people were running Windows XP, you know, Windows 2000, whatever, that's the financial world, they do that. That's what's crazy. Well, with this, you could still run it, but not have quite as much risk because it doesn't have to be tied in to all of your other systems. And that would be a great solution that I'm sure they're not doing in the <laughs> banking world or the hospitals or the train stations or the airports and everything that got hit. But that, that would be a great way if you have to run old operating systems this is a great way to do it. Now, the Cube's website has a really great intro, and if that has enticed you, we are going to do a how to install Cubes and how to configure Cubes video on the Linux channel. We're waiting for some updates to the Ryzen platform, but Ryzen, especially like a 1700, like an 8-core, or even a 6-core, 1600, is a great platform for this type of operating system. It even supports GPU pass-through um, for you know, passing through a graphics card like you would on Linux. And so we're going to do a complete guide and installation configuration video for Cubes for the Linux channel. So if that's of interest to you, there's a link to the Linux channel in the description. You should subscribe there. So if you just want to know what the you know what sort of the state of the art is with virtualization and the kinds of things that are out there, Cubes is pretty much bleeding edge for what it offers. A lot of you might be thinking, oh, finally, finally, I'm going to have a Linux desktop and I'm going to run Windows even if it's Windows 7, I don't care. I'll run Windows 7 and a virtual machine, and I'm going to play my Steam games in that. Oh, the future is now. Well, the, the future is not quite now. <laughs> so close. Yeah, they so with Vega, where is Vega? We don't know. <laughs> with Vega, they actually promised that maybe they would give us the, the, the Rosetta Stone to unlock this, but then at the last moment, snatched it away. <laughs>
So there's a technology called SRIOV. It stands for Single Root IO Virtualization. It's been available in the enterprise. In fact, a lot of the technology that is in cubes has been available in the enterprise for the better part of 10 years. All of this is old hat for, for enterprise computing, the way that virtual machines work, virtual desktops. You may have VDI infrastructure in, in a company that you work for. Um, SRIOV is you can take a graphics card, uh, a special kind of graphics card for servers, and you can provide a virtual desktop or a virtual machine that is shared among several users. And so, you know, NVIDIA, for example, has a popular one um, that has, you know, 16 gigabytes of HBM2 memory, kind of like Vega, and it will provide support for up to 16 users on a single machine. So 16 virtual machines on a single machine, and all of those have access to the full GPU capabilities or a portion of the full GPU capabilities um, of that graphics card. So if, for example, this is, you know, this laptop has both Intel and NVIDIA. And so while I can pass through the entire graphics card, the second entire graphics card to the VM, I can't have one uh, graphics adapter shared among two virtual machines. But even if RX Vega would only support SRIOV for just two clients, that would pretty much mean that it's not going to be used in the server market, but it would let you use those graphics capabilities with two virtual machines or, or the host and a virtual machine or something like that. And so the way that we're running Windows seamlessly here, we would also be able to run a game seamlessly as well. But because we can't, we need to pass through a full graphics card. And we can do that today. It's just not as convenient. Now, this is something they can do. This is not like, what if? It's done in the enterprise. Yeah, the graphics manufacturers just need to give you the ability to do that. So, if you're vocal about it, uh, <laughs> maybe. Uh, but the thing about cubes that is most exciting is not what it can do now. That's pretty cool what it can do now. I mean, it's really impressive. But it's just like we're we're like ninety percent of the way there on some really really amazing technology. It's like imagine a world, <laughs> and that's this the possibility of the future is the really incredible part. Yeah. So I want you to imagine a version of cubes in the future where you do have a graphics card that supports single root IO virtualization, but you also have technologies that are supported um, for moving a live running virtual machine between devices. This is something that we have in the enterprise under certain circumstances. If you have machines that are similar enough in terms of architecture, processor architecture, you know, whatever, um, you can move running virtual machines that people are using from one server to another without them realizing that anything has happened. And this is really convenient for high availability, for uptime, let's say a power supply goes out of a server or a drive array is failing or a network card is failing or a server is doing something weird. As long as the server hasn't completely crashed, you can move those running virtual machines from the, VM, from the server, the host that needs updating or needs whatever type of maintenance. Um, so imagine that on a personal level, imagine that coming to an individual so you're running an application on your cell phone and that you can migrate it to your laptop or you can migrate a running application from your laptop to your desktop. A lot of problems go away. Synchronization becomes a different proposition. Instead of having you know, OneDrive or Dropbox or Google Drive or something in the cloud that's synchronizing all of your files, you could just move the running virtual machine between your devices. Maybe, maybe the virtual machine doesn't even have to leave your phone. Maybe the, the virtual machine continues to run on your phone and you just have the graphics portion of it actually run on another computer. We already have that technology in the enterprise and projects like Cubes are bringing that technology to the individual. It's really exciting. Now we, we should mention that Cubes is not specifically working on the mobile thing. We don't wanna, <laughs> we don't wanna sell any <laughs> falsehoods here, but uh, it is something that with this technology, you can see it being a real possibility. Yeah. You, could, you could really just have a single operating, not even an operating system, but a number of operating systems in this situation yeah. with you at all times. And, you know, there's never a shutdown. You never stop using it. You just switch from phone to desktop to laptop or whatever. It just goes with you. Yeah. If you're already locked into a platform, like locked into Windows or, or locked into Mac OS, Cubes gives you a shot at freedom without actually really giving up anything. So you can transition to a more open operating system. You can use cubes, not just for security, but also full access to whatever you want. So in that sense, you can be OS agnostic. It, it doesn't really matter. I mean, 
You don't have to get married to Apple. You don't have to get married to Microsoft. You don't have to get married to Linux. You can run FreeBSD. You can run a lot of other operating systems. It doesn't really matter. You can use what works best for you. And if the situation changes, you know, you can keep using the old stuff for legacy purposes. Maybe you've got an old application that you want to run. But, you know, for your other computing, you can use what's secure and what's best for you. Well, I think if you're going to use the marriage analogy, this is really big of me. <laughs> as many as you want. As long as you got to support them, you got to have the RAM. <laughs> well, there you have it, folks. Uh, we're checking out. Uh, we'll see you in the Level 1 <laughs> forum. Uh, and watch out for the <laughs> installation video on the Level 1 Linux channel. <laughs> TLDR, you should check out Cubes. Cubes is the future of computing. Whether or not you use it yourself, this is where computing is going, this type of virtualization. So you should take a look at it and see, you know, not necessarily Cubes itself, but what Cubes does is the future. See ya.